so that's lovely. I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, a little bit about me, just to introduce myself. Um, I'm not a landscape architect. I actually came into this really as a parent and through a series of coincidences. It uh, wasn't very well planned. Um, but I became aware really that there was a problem with play. I think when my son was about five and he climbed to the top of the highest climbing frame in the local playground, which wasn't very high, came down again and announced that he was bored, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and th this was quite concerning really. Uh, what happened next was uh, a, not a notice appeared in the cafe next to the playground saying, uh, great news, we've got £100,000 from the lottery for a new playground. Brilliant. And friends of Parks group came round for doing a little consultation about it. And I was like, oh, really exciting new playground coming, £100,000 worth of new playground. And she said, yeah, but it won't be as good as the one that was there before. And I just thought, how can you spend £100,000 on a new playground and come up with something worse, you know? So uh, that's part of where my passion, I suppose, comes for, for, from for, for this issue. Um, it was a series of coincidences. I was working on websites. I was asked to do a website for a small charity called Playlink. Um, it turned out that they needed me to write it for them, and through that process, I got interested and I became more involved. Um, my day job now, I run a small charity in Hackney called Hackney Play Association, and we actually run two adventure playgrounds in Hackney. So that's what I do all day. That's my paid role. Um, I also have a voluntary role, which as I'm the Chair of Trustees of Play England, which is the national charity for children's play. Um, play England now is completely unfunded by the government, and so we are all volunteers. Um, but like Adam, I have a fantastic board. We have 15 of us, uh, all of whom are volunteers. Uh, we have people, we have landscape architects, we have play workers, we have people from after school clubs, we have parks managers who of course raise the issue of maintenance and those maintenance budgets very forcefully with us on a regular basis and so we have a really good mix of people from different backgrounds who have an interest in children's play coming together and working together with Play England. I'm going to pick up very briefly on what Carly said about Scotland uh, and possibly be a little bit political here. There's a reason why things are going so well in Scotland for children and that reason is because the leadership is coming from the top from the Scottish Government on children and on play and that is, the, that is partly because play is a devolved issue, so it's devolved to the Government of Scotland and the Government of Wales and the Government of Northern Ireland to deliver on play, and boy do they do that. You know, so there is fantastic work going on in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland launched a TV campaign last week uh, about parents and play, uh, the, the hashtag is Play Matters, that's well worth a look. Um, there's fantastic leadership uh, coming from government in those three countries. There is no leadership on play coming from the government of Westminster at the moment. It's not in any minister's portfolio or brief. When the ministers from the other three nations met last November, nobody from Westminster would come. So um, it is actually when uh, the coalition were elected nearly 10 years ago. One of the first things that they cut was the national play strategy. They, they actually said it was a typical example of Labour government waste, children's play, and there has been nothing from the national government on play since then. Anyway, party political broadcast over now, <laughs> but I couldn't let that one go, I'm afraid. Um, I, as Adam, Adam mentioned, the design for play, that was music to my ears. It's now 10 years ago, and so it's amazing to hear that it's still salient and relevant and being used. I was lucky enough to become involved in writing this. Uh, I, my role as the parent and the lay person, we were led by Aileen Shackle, who is a landscape architect, and so every time Aileen said landform, I said, you mean, you mean hilly things, don't you, Aileen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and we went from there. Um, so it's great to be able to go out and still talk about design for play and the uh, 10 design principles that Aileen came up with on the back of an envelope on Sunday afternoon in her, uh, in her living room. Um, but to my main topic today, adventure playgrounds and a very brief history. Uh, adventure playgrounds started really in the 1940s during World War II. Uh, they were started really by a landscape architect, so and there's a lot of landscape architect involvement 
throughout the Adventure Playground movement, started with Carl Theodor Sorensen, landscape architect in Denmark, and he became fascinated by watching children play on building sites and how they play. And there's a very, there's a very common theme around this in the play movement and in landscape architecture of people watching how, how a place is used and then thinking about what they learn from that. Uh, he set up the first adventure playground at Amdrop in Copenhagen. It was called a junk playground, not an adventure playground. And it was a collaboration, really, between Carl Sorensen, the landscape architect, and also uh, John Bertelsen, who was a, what the Danes would call a pedagogue. We would probably call that a play worker in the UK. And uh, I think this is very interesting because there's real synergies between landscape architecture and play work, but there are also tensions. Um, uh, again, I think Carly mentioned um, you know, what it looks like. How important is what the site looks like? You know, and there's a real tension there, because a lot of play workers would say it doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter at all. I don't think that's quite right. I think it does matter what adventure playgrounds look like, because they've got to be attractive and appealing to children for a start. And I also think, think things like litter, clean toilets, all of these things are really, really important in terms of making a site appealing and welcoming to children. Um, Lady Ellen of Hartwood, another, another great landscape architect, um, elected first fellow of the Institute of Landscape Architects in 1930. She was also a prolific campaigner for the welfare of children. She did a lot of work with UNICEF. She was very interested in children who'd been affected by the war and uh, who were were immigrants or have been displaced. Um, she was a great campaigner and she was very interested in the effects, what was happening to children in high-rise developments and how they were cut off from, from, the world, uh, from the world below. And that is still a really, really current issue. I mean, that's coming up now in London uh, with, the London, with the discussions on the London plan and what the uh, London mayor is thinking about that. Um, she visited Edinburgh in 1946, and she was completely blown away by it and, and inspired by it, and she came back to begin a campaign of building adventure playgrounds in the UK. And it's worth just saying about Edinburgh as well, is there's always been something slightly countercultural and challenging about the adventure playground movement, and I should have said this when it, I was on the slide about Edinburgh, but it was set up, as you see, in 1943. That was during World War II. <coughs> And it was, it was kind of a subtle challenge to the sort of authoritarian and controlling view of Nazism in Denmark at that time. And Denmark was actually occupied by the Nazis. Their idea was very much about how you control children and you control people. And so this idea of setting up a place where children have freedom of control, it was a challenge to that. And I think that continues actually to be the case even in the UK now, I think there's a very prevailing view that children need to be controlled in school and by their parents. And so adventure playgrounds, I think, still uh, pose a bit of a challenge because the idea in the adventure playground and the idea in play work is that the children are in control and that the children control and, and own the space. Anyway, as I say, Lady Allen visited uh, Emdrop in, in 1946 completely swept off her feet. I think there's some really interesting, I'm not going to read it all out, but there are interesting themes here. The children could dig, build houses, experiment with sand, water, fire, play games of adventure and make believe. You know, and I think those are all elements that we still really want to see in adventure playgrounds and actually as much as possible in other types of playground as well. Then again, you know, the, the John Bertelsmann and, uh, and his role I think uh, as the play worker in that space, she also saw it as being quite key. And these are common themes that I think continue to modern day adventure playgrounds. So she came back and she started campaigning and building adventure playgrounds, mainly in the London area. And they focused on areas of deprivation. So to this day, a lot of adventure playgrounds are in East London, where I work in Hackney, Tower Hamlets, Islington, which of course was a very poor borough uh, at that time, uh, Southwark, Lambeth, South London. Um, at the time, a lot of these spaces became adventure playgrounds. The land value was incredibly low. 
A lot of them were old bomb sites, derelict places. That's obviously changed <laughs> quite radically, and that poses some quite significant challenges, existential challenges in some cases. Um, they're still staffed by plane workers, though. That's a common theme that has continued throughout that time. Uh, I would say another defining characteristic of adventure playgrounds is the use of loose parts and the idea that children can use and manipulate all sorts of different things and also that children can use tools. Um, the adventure playground movement was supported by uh, the National Playing Fields Association, which is now Fields and Trust. And this is another important adventure play, another important um, organisation. Lady Allen had a hand in uh, getting this going. And why it's important is it because of its role in protecting land and, deeds of, and supporting deeds of dedication so that places like adventure playgrounds uh, can, can get that kind of level of pr protection. Um, two other organisations that Lady Ellen was also involved in setting up, uh, LAPA and HAPA. Uh, this was the London Adventure Playgrounds Association and what was called now the, uh, the, what was called then the Handicapped Adventure Playground Association. Um, both of these organisations have evolved. LAPA became Playlink in 1996. Uh, HAPA uh, eventually merged and became, uh, the, became part of the charity Kids. And so a lot of that work continues. I would say actually that Play England now plays the role in supporting adventure playgrounds uh, in <coughs> England now. Uh, Playlink moved more into unstaffed playgrounds and design of those. Another really key element, I refer briefly to Loose Parks. Um, again, you know, Nicholson was an architect who was actually writing in the uh, Journal of Landscape Architecture in 1971. And it's this idea that in any environment, the degree of inventiveness and creativity and the possibility of discovery are directly proportional to the number and kinds of variables in it. So this idea that what really makes a play space is that there are lots of different things with unspecified roles or possibilities that children can manipulate how they choose and that is a really key element of uh, staffed adventure playgrounds. So on to adventure playgrounds today. This is one of my adventure playgrounds in Hackney and that's a typical group of adventure playground children. Um, I suppose key things today, uh, adventure playgrounds are what are called open access which means that children are free to come and go as they please. And the quid pro quo for that is that they, there's a light to touch system of regulation by uh, the regulator at Ofsted. Um, open access poses huge challenges for us now uh, because so many parents don't want their children to be free to come and go as they please. And they're really quite concerned about that. And uh, it's a really difficult because you can have a great facility like an adventure playground, but if children don't have independent mobility, if the streets are not designed so that children can get from play, can get to them, then that is very difficult indeed. We're, we're lucky in Hackney that there have been a lot of attempts to reduce traffic, increase cycling, uh, but even in Hackney, uh, very challenging children being able to be out and about. Uh, in public space on their own or getting to and from an adventure playground. Um, as I said, adventure playgrounds still staffed by play workers and I suppose the importance of that is as a profession, uh, we're a profession that uh, for us play is the most important outcome and our role is that we're there to support play, we're not there to make the children learn or to develop or any of those things. Play as far as we're concerned is an outcome in itself and that's what we're there for. Um, I think when you have staff at a playground, uh, it offers other possibilities that you wouldn't necessarily get in a non-staff playground. It gives the opportunity to provide some support for disabled children, for example. It allows the possibility of use of tools because you can have some supervision of that. You wouldn't just leave the tools lying around in a park. Uh, so, the, so it does create other possibilities that differentiate it a bit from other types of playground. I think the other really key thing Certainly for us in Hackney now is uh, the, the, the adventure playgrounds I think are very effective in supporting vulnerable children, uh, by which I mean children who are growing up in poverty, poverty uh, child poverty, where this adventure playground is based is 48%, that's one in every two children in 
what is actually quite an affluent borough of Hackney are growing up in poverty. And I think this thing with open access where it's a bit on the edge and it's a bit slightly alternative is very appealing uh, to families who are in a very marginal position. Um, and I think the Adventure Playground movement has been particularly effective at engaging and working with children who other services quite often would describe as hard to reach. However, um, they are publicly funded by and large, either through local authorities or through public funds like the lottery, and they are therefore under massive pressure at the moment due to austerity. I think even councils like Hackney that are really keen politically to support them are reaching the point where it is a struggle. Um, final thing about adventure playgrounds, Adam also mentioned uh, managing risk in play provision. That, that is something that we use in adventure playgrounds every day. Uh, all of our staff are trained in this and that's actually been quite transformational for us in making the case to the authorities about things like safeguarding, for instance. Carly mentioned the challenges around safeguarding. It's similar to the challenge around health and safety. You have to weigh up the risks and the benefits and come to a professional judgement about this. Um, I do a lot of surveying of children. Uh, the, this actually, this is the Hackney Mayor and the Deputy Mayor with a group of children. Uh, the children are doing a bit of advocacy, and uh, let's just say that he couldn't say no, particularly not to Joanna in the blue in the front row, who is quite friendly. <laughs> 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 and and uh, you know, and, I mean, we have got great political support in Hackney. Um, but one of the things I'm often asked to do by funders is to evidence, you know, what difference do you make, what is the value of this, and I, I do a lot of surveying of children, and so I go around once a couple of times a year and I ask children about how they feel when they're at the playground, what they like, what they'd like to improve, what that kind of thing. When I ask children how do you feel when you're playing, the words that come up over and over again are happy and free happy and free. Sometimes they say I feel safe, sometimes they feel like, say I feel excited, but happy and free. And I was actually a bit overwhelmed by it the first time, you know, I did it. I was like, bloody hell, you know, 90% of these children have spontaneously used the word happy in, in, uh, in, at a time when we have such massive concerns about children's mental health. Um, last summer, for the first time, I also surveyed parents. Why do you let your child come here, you know? And the parents were very, very consistent. Almost every single parent said, I want my child to be running around outdoors. And they then said, I'm, I'm desperate to get my child off their mobile phone, off screens, <laughs> and away from social media. Um, I agree with Carly, there's pros and cons to the screens. Um, I have to say, I think they, there is a massive challenge with the screens, and because they're addictive parents have real difficulty getting their children off them. Um, we have a cunning plan for tackling the screens at the Adventure Playground. I have bought about a dozen chargers of different types and as the children arrive with their mobile phones like this, I say, uh, would, you, would you like to put that in my office to charge? And, 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 and I go, yeah, okay, and I go, just, you know, it'll come, come back and get it at the end, it's all, it's all, it's all charged up. But, yeah. So, uh, and that seems to work very well, so it's a bit of a tactic and a device, but, um, but, but we feel that the uniqueness of our space is that it's an outdoor space, and if they're like this, well, you know, they're not getting the maximum benefit that they could be getting from that space. So I'm a bit manipulative <laughs> in how I deal with it. Okay, um, last, last bit, I just want to show you a very quick video of, uh, of about, well, it's about my organisation, Hackney Play Association, but it will hopefully give you a sort of flavour of uh, what adventure playgrounds are like nowadays and uh, you know, maybe hear from the children themselves. It was made by a young filmmaker called Misha Rowe, who uh, did it for us free, basically, so amazing uh, young journalist, and um, so big thanks to her. Okay.
because everything is amazing. Thank you. Uh, any questions, please? 